hello and welcome back to our channel for this video lecture we are going to have a short and simple discussion on some of the topics on pharmacology and we are going to discuss some drugs acting on respiratory system okay so uh drugs uh which acts on the upper respiratory tract so for other um, medications for other drugs it will be discussed on separate um, video lectures so this is what I have uh, come up with this um, video lecture and yes only the presentation that I make is to tell something about the drug what are the uses what are the indications then it's pharmacokinetics by absorption distribution metabolism and elimination with its contraindications and precautions so you see that's the way i present things and um i i try to to um present it the simplest way possible and again i highly recommend to read on books uh write down notes listen to your teachers lectures and read more and more books do not rely on one uh, reference only so um, drugs on the upper respiratory tract they keep the airways open and gases moving efficiently so um, they have different classifications different groups of um, uh, drugs or medications under this um, uh, presentation so first is we have anti-intrusives Okay, so they, uh, the simplest action that I can share is they block cough reflex. Especially these are used for uh, dry cough. Then we have decongestants. They decrease the blood flow to the upper respiratory tract and decrease the overproduction of secretions. We also have histamines. They block the release or they block the action of histamine that increases secretions and uh, narrow the airways uh, we also have expectorants which in turn um, they increase productive cough to clear the airways or to expel it okay to expel the uh, secretions then we have the mucolytics okay so this uh, group of drugs uh, they increase or liquefy respiratory secretions to aid the clearing of the airways so with that um, if for instance you have a cough um, you must know the characteristic of cough that that what what type of cough do your um, let's say buyer from a from a pharmacy or your patient have you ask them because not all types of cough or not all medication is um for all these type of uh, medications so better assess for especially the type of cough so let's uh, have a simple discussion of each of the group so first is you have anti intrusives they uh, usually suppress cough reflex and some of the medications we have uh, Presented, we, we are going to present here are benzonatine, uh, codeine, dextrometrophan, and hydrocodone. Okay, so, uh, of course, there are many and many uh, other drugs, so especially in the market. Okay, some may be present here in this uh, video lecture, some may not. Okay, so, it's important to read the labels, know the classifications. So its therapeutic actions are to act directly on the medullary cough center of the brain to depress the cough reflex. And they are usually not intended for patients with head injury and uh, central nervous system depression because of its uh, action on the uh, brain. Okay, since it's depressant, so it will not be good for patients with head injuries and uh, same as depression 
So the indication of this is for treatment of non-productive cough. So when you say non-productive cough, usually there are no production of secretions, or it's not mucoid type of cough. So um, they are used. They are also used to control cold symptoms. So or colds. Okay. So they are also good for nasal congestion, uh, and usually nasal. They, uh, congestion results from dilation of nasal blood vessels. I repeat, nasal congestion is the result from nasal blood vessels, dilation of nasal blood vessels. And um, it's pharmacokinetics. It is usually absorbed, rapidly absorbed by the body and uh, locally or even widely distributed throughout the body, especially on the areas to be have its action and it's metabolized by the liver and excreted by urine. And usually this is uh, avoided during pregnancy and lactation. So if you are pregnant, if you're lactating, it's always good to consult your OB or physician. So contraindications and concerns. With antitussives, patients who need to cough to maintain airways, of course, because this is a cough suppressant. Uh, carefully uh, used to uh, asthma and emphysema patients. Caution on addiction, sedation, and drowsiness. Okay, that's why I think one of this uh, issue before of a certain drug um, was brought up to the public because of its addiction uh, uh, effect. Okay, so that is one of the caution. Okay. Adverse effects is drying effect on the mucous membranes, drowsiness, sedation, nausea, constipation, uh, dry mouth, GI upset, headache, and dizziness. Okay, so depending on the adverse effects, you must also uh, caution your um, patients who are taking in these types of uh, medications especially for example drowsiness sedation and if they're going to drive uh, vehicles if they are going to manipulate machineries so uh, caution for these um, activities and these medications okay then constipation GI upset and uh, usually this is uncomfortable for patients and likewise headache and dizziness so uh, this must be informed okay and uh, appropriate nursing interventions can also be done with these adverse effects okay. and then next we have antihistamines it is usually found uh, on OTC prescript uh, preparations and um, when you say OTC, these are over-the-counter uh, preparations. They usually don't need uh, uh, this, uh, prescriptions. And uh, antihistamines usually relieve uh, respiratory symptoms and to treat allergies. Okay? They block the effects of histamine. Okay? And um, uh, over-the-counter antihistamines such as uh, diphen, uh Hydramine and other um, medications like diamond hydronite, or uh, this can be taken um, for motion sickness, especially for those who are traveling or who are fond of traveling but are usually having motion sickness. This is usually um, prescribed, and this should be taken 30 minutes before. Uh, traveling okay so therapeutic actions they selectively block the effects of histamine the histamine one receptor sites decreasing allergic response okay so uh usually uh, on this video lecture purposes i won't really dwell on the anatomy but later on i can make um, um video lecture separately but uh, for these purposes i'll be focusing on the drugs and also, uh, these antihistamines have anti-allergic, uh, anticholinergic, and antipyretic uh, effects. Okay, so uh, if you happen to remember your anticholinergic drugs, 
that's also the effect of antihistamines and antipyretic for HNS varietus, okay, as the name implies. So indications are for allergy and other anaphylactic reactions, okay, so for, for allergies. Um, also, it is uh, used for uh, exercise-induced asthma and histamine-induced uh, bronchoconstriction in asthma. Okay, but of course, you need to seek for consultation first before taking in any drug, especially for asthma, because of course, your doctor knows best. Okay, though we can search it on the internet, but of course, um, we have this uh, professional uh, licensed medical practitioners whom we should go for. Okay? And they can give the best advice and best actions for you to do. Uh, pharmacokinetics for antihistamine. Uh, generally, this is oral and it has an onset of 1 to 3 hours distributed widely in the body, metabolized by the liver, excreted through feces. And again, this should be avoided during pregnancy and lactation. Okay. Uh, adverse effects, drowsiness. I know uh, maybe some of you have taken antihistamines and this is one of the most common side effects, drowsiness even sedation, uh, anticholinergic effects, these are the effects, drying of mucous membranes, GI upset. Um, uh, the patient can also experience nausea, arrhythmias, uh, dysuria, urinary hesitancy, and also itching. Okay? Then we go to the next. We have expectorants. Okay? For expectorants, from uh, a related word expel okay you expel out okay the secretions so uh, they loosen they liquefy the lower respiratory tract secretions they reduce the viscosity of these secretions and making it easier for the patient for the individual to cough out okay so usually one of the most common examples for this expectorant is guaifenesin okay so therapeutic action of this is to enhance, it enhances the output of respiratory tract fluids by reducing the adhesiveness okay, and, and surface tension of these fluids. So usually these are the sticky ones, okay, the sticky ones, uh, and uh, they are usually easier to uh, move uh, of the less uh, viscous secretions. So it makes your cough or your secretions more productive and uh, it may lead to less frequency of coughing because you can expel it already, okay? So maybe most of the time that's the reason why you have this cough because of the irritation and because of the presence of these secretions. Okay? Indications are respiratory conditions characterized by dry, non-productive cough including the common cold, bronchitis, and also influenza. Okay, they are absorbed uh, generally orally, then onset of 30 minutes, so that's um, quite fast of an onset of a, a therapeutic effect to, to set in or to start. Then duration is also quite long, for the six hours. Okay. Adverse effects are the most common are GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Okay. Then headache, dizziness can also be experienced and mild rashes. Uh, prolonged use of uh, OTC um, expectorants can uh, mask more serious underlying disorder. So uh, it's usually not used for more than one week. If it persists, uh, we consult the, the physician or your prescriber, okay? Then we have the mucolytics. For mucolytics, um, the drug usually breaks down uh, tenacious mucus in order to aid the high-risk respiratory patient in coughing up thick uh, tenacious secretions from, from uh, the syllable, okay? From the suffix litix, litix, okay? So they break down, okay? Uh, mucus 
and uh, it can be through nebulization or installation in the trachea and if you have um, read in your books or if you have experience um, during nebulization bronchodilators first are used before mucolytics I repeat bronchodilators first then mucolytics okay one good example here is acetylcysteine, uh, the one you, it's, I think it's in powder form, then you mix it up uh, with, with the amount of water and uh, drink it. Okay. Uh, you see, you, uh, going back to your bronchodilators, you should have it first five minutes before mucolytic drug. Okay. So the main concept is bronchodilators first before mucolytic drugs. Then we have um, uh, indications for patients who have difficulty mobilizing and coughing up secretions because of tenacious um, what's this, uh, secretions. So for some diseases, it's also good for COPDs, uh, TB, pneumonia, atelectasis or lung collapse, uh, patients, with uh, tracheostomies. Okay. Then contra uh, contraindications, bronchospasm, uh, peptic ulcers, esophageal viruses, because these conditions may be aggravated. And um, adverse effects, GI upset, stomatitis, rhinorrhea, and bronchospasm and rashes. Oh. So, okay, additional information for at nice to mean. I uh, apologize for the uh, concerns in the slides. Okay, so at nice to means they again block the effects of histamine and it can have a relief from itchy eyes, swelling, congestion, and drippiness or runny nose. And in anti histamine, there are usually first and second generation. Um, first, Generation have greater anticholinergic effects as I have told in my earlier slides. Uh, Antihistamines have anticholinergic effects. Okay, so first generation have anticholinergic greater anticholinergic effects, and the second generation have lesser anticholinergic effects. So I know you're familiar with cetirizine, um, diphenhydramine. Uh, what else? These are first generation uh, antihistamines. We also have loratidine for second generation uh, antihistamines. Okay, I think those are the names which you are uh, familiar with. Again, just to emphasize therapeutic action, selectively block the effects of histamine at the histamine 1 receptor site, decreasing allergic responses. And Further, for 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 other uses, relief of symptoms associated with allergic rhinitis, allergic conjunctivitis rather, and urticarial um, problems. Then allergic reactions to blood and or blood blood products, anaphylactic reactions, and hyperventilation and bronchoconstriction related to asthma. Just like what we have mentioned earlier. Then pharmacokinetics, uh, okay, so somewhat similar, okay. Again, uh, it's uh, orally absorbed, um, distributed widely, and it should be avoided during pregnancy and lactation, and it's um, metabolized by the liver, excreted through urine and feces. Then caution is for patients with kidney and uh, liver impairment. Usually, all drugs need to um, have a caution for patients with uh, kidney problems and liver problems. So you must uh, report it to your physician. And uh, I know, we know that uh, physicians uh, know best, okay, uh, if you have underlying conditions, right? That's why they usually ask what are the, uh, do you have some history of this disease? Do you have a current? Uh, comorbidity and what are the medications that you also take okay because this all uh, these conditions may have uh, certain effects on 
possible uh, uh, prescribed medications. Okay. Adverse effects, again, drowsiness and sedation, the most common. And drying of the respiratory NGI mucous membranes, uh, GI upset, nausea, arrhythmias, dysuria, urticaria, with dryness. And usually these are anticholinergic effects of your antihistamines. Then we have the congestants. Okay, usually these are used for colds, and again, colds are usually the uh, it causes dilation of nasal blood vessels. Okay, and um, most are usually from uh, sympathomimetics or adrenergics, uh, adrenergic drugs. They again they cause uh, local vasoconstriction to counteract dilation of the nasal uh, blood vessels and this will lead to decreased blood flow to the irritated and dilated capillaries of the mucous membranes uh, lining the nasal and, uh, and sinus cavity vasoconstriction okay so uh, there will be shrinking or decrease in size of swollen membranes then it will open clog nasal packages, uh, passages rather and Hopefully, there will be a relief from the discomfort of a clogged nose. And uh, nasal, uh, there are, I think, one or uh, two or three uh, types here. First is we have nasal decongestants. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with these drugs, but uh, it's good to present it here. Okay, or you may know other decongestants okay so these decongestants work directly at target organs again they are symptomatics they imitate the effects of, CN of SNS to uh, cause vasoconstriction leading to decreased edema and inflammation with nasal membranes and uh, these are OTC drugs these are having fewer side effects these nasal decongestants and um, if we have an inhaler, okay, um, this we need for, what's this, um, it can be for cough or other uh, purposes. Uh, the advantage of using uh, inhalers um, instead of oral ones, um, they minimize the risk of adrenal uh, suppression. Okay. They have uh, fewer side effects. Okay. So indication is to dilate nares to relieve pain and congestion of otitis media. Okay. They also open nasal passages, better drainage of eustachian tube, relieving the pressure in the uh, middle ear. Then pharmacokinetics, uh, topical, um, locally, it's distributed locally, uh, directly on target organ, metabolized by the liver, excreted through urine. Okay, caution is for presence of lesions or erosions and conditions that may be exacerbated by SNS activity. So these are usually cautioned or not intended to. We have glaucoma, hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease, etc. Okay, conditions that may be exacerbated by SNS uh, related activities. Okay, adverse effects, local burning and stinging uh, sensation on the affected part uh, or, or administered part. Then rebound congestion may happen okay, if used longer than 3 to 5 days. So congestion is caused usually by vasodilation as we have said and if the drug is already wearing off. Okay, but again, as our um, references would say, it's only for three to five days and consult your physician, okay, your prescriber. Then another decongestant, oral decongestants, already taken to decrease uh, nasal congestion related to um, the common colds, sinusitis, and allergic rhinitis. Okay? Uh, but I guess some of you also have uh, nasal decongestants which is related to sinusitis and allergic rhinitis. So it depends still 
on what is prescribed to you. Okay? Congestion of otitis media, opening of the nasal passage, allows better drainage of eustachian tube, relieving pressure in the middle ear. Okay? So uh, it relieves congestion on the middle ear. Uh, minimize adrenal suppression and non-systemic in effect also. Okay? So uh, same with your nasal decongestants. Uh, therapeutic actions, it shrinks the uh, nasal mucous membrane by stimulating the alpha adrenergic receptors. As we have mentioned, these are uh, sympathomimetics. And they decrease, in, uh, they decrease the membrane size and there is possible drainage of the sinuses improving the airflow. Then pharmacokinetics, these are absorbed systemic, uh, systematically or systemically rather than uh, also orally. These are well absorbed um, peak levels or the most effective levels are uh, uh, after 20 to 45 minutes after onset, widely distributed, metabolized by the liver excreted through the urine. Um, Again, cautions are the same conditions that might be exacerbating or be exacerbated by SNS activities. Okay. Adverse effects the same. It has rebound congestion, anxiety also, tenseness, restlessness, tremors, hypertension, arrhythmias, uh, sweating, and pallor. Then we have your topical nasal steroids. Okay, steroid decongestants. This is usually good for um, for allergic rhinitis, effective in patients who are no longer getting a response with other types of decongestants. And these are the examples. I think one of your uh, familiar is, is dexamethasone. Okay, also meclometasone. Okay, put in aside also. The therapeutic action. Uh, based from references, the, uh, the exact action is not known, but uh, it has an, an anti-inflammatory um, action which results from ability to produce a direct local effect that blocks many of the complex reactions responsible for the inflammatory response and the onset of is not imaged. Okay? The onset of the drug is not imaged. So, um, what is good for topical administrations, um, it has lesser chance of systemic absorption, especially when used longer than 30 days. Okay? If no effects are seen uh, after three weeks, you can, uh, you can uh, discontinue and or report to your prescriber. And uh, rebound congestion may also result uh, if a client overuses a nasal decongestant spray, and when you say rebound congestion, um, it is usually rebound vasodilation of the nasal mucosa. Okay, so your nasal passages become congested again. Then uses are of allergic rhinitis, inflammation from nasal polyps. Okay, uh, locally absorbed. Under indications are acute infections, um, caution is or avoidance on contagious infections also. Local burning, a sensation, irritation, stinging, a sensation, dryness of mucosa and headache are the adverse effects. Then we have bronchodilators. Okay, these are in anti-asthmatics, and these are some drugs used to treat obstruction. Uh, pulmonary uh, disorders like asthma, emphysema, COPD, okay, which is usually causing inflammation of the passages uh, and usually this is on the lower respiratory tract and narrowing of the airways can happen. Um, this is used to enhance uh, bronchodilation. Okay? And um, this is used to facilitate respiration by, the, by dilating the airways. These are usually symptomatic relief or prevention of bronchial asthma. So it can be relief or prevention of asthma. 
and bronchospasm associated with COPDs. Okay. Um, these are administered already and absorbed systematic, uh, systemically. Others are by nebulization, which uh, provides fewer side effects compared to oral administration. Um, usually, as I mentioned earlier, if there's combination with steroids also, uh, the first one to, to be uh, administered are inhalers, for example, albuterol and uh, after five minutes um, steroids okay so bronchodilators first to open the airway then followed by steroids um, because this has a direct uh, target this has rapid and uh, more rapid onset and you only need smaller dose so it gives you fewer side effects although it has a shorter half-life also okay um, one of the most commonly uh, mentioned effect or risk for bronchodilators, especially um, uh, the inhalants, are uh, patients are prone to uh, candida infections. So as a precautionary measure or preventive uh, measure against uh, candida infections, rinse the mouth with water after each use of these inhalants. Um, some also are short-acting inhaled uh, beta-2 agonists and they provide quick relief although okay, uh, tendency is since it's quick relief uh, tendency is that frequent usage may uh, be done and this frequent usage may lead to nervousness okay and based from what I have read, one of the most first, uh, one of the first, rather, one of the first non-selective beta blocker is isoproterenol. And its other uh, examples are hypotropium, which is a uh, anticholinergic. And this uh, usually dilate uh, bronchioles. Okay. Um, for for sake of asthma, this is usually treated according to severity, okay? And um, the onset of inhaled dose usually is faster than that of the oral doses, okay? So, and over-the-counter um, antihistamine, um, again, uh, actually, Oh, sorry, it's anti asthmatics. Okay, it should be anti asthmatics. Okay, so it's it has an anti cholinergic or rather anti cholinergic effects. So just remember what we have uh, presented in the first few slides about anti cholinergics. So that can also happen with these bronchodilators and anti asthmatics. Uh, Ipratopium is. Uh, as far as I can remember, it is, it is usually prepared as uh, nebulization also. Then we have xanthines also for asthma. Uh, these examples are aminophilin, uh, caffeine, diphilin, theophilin. So as you can observe, they are easy to, rem to remember because of the likeness of the names, but also be cautioned because still, uh, you must follow what is ordered by the physician. Aminophilin is an IV derivative of theophilin and usually uh, the dosage for patients who are smokers are, are increased. Okay. Therapeutic actions, direct effect. Um, direct effect on smooth muscles of respiratory tract and um, they relax the bronchi and blood vessels. They inhibit the release of slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis and histamine. They further decrease the bronchial swelling and narrowing. So provides a uh, good uh, or better airflow. Uh, indications are for symptomatic relief or prevention of asthma and reversal of bronchospasm. And the treatment of apnea, bachycardia, 
bradycardia in premature infants. Uh, pharmacokinetics is usually absorbed by the GI peak levels of two hours. It's widely distributed and it passes the placenta and breast milk. So again, uh, caution for uh, for pregnant and lactating mothers. Okay. Then metabolism is on the liver and excreted through the urine. Uh, cautions for GI problems, coronary diseases, respiratory dysfunction, renal or hepatic diseases, hyperthyroidism because they may aggravate okay, the condition. So it's better to report them to your physician. Adverse effects, again, uh, it increases uh, level, leads, uh, increasing level of the use of something uh, leads to GI upset, nausea, irritability, uh, tachycardia, palpitations, uh, seizures, brain damage, and death. Okay, so these are not only simple adverse effects, but severe, okay, life-threatening adverse effects. Then we have leukotriene receptor antagonists. These are new classes based from one book, but I'm not sure how, how long was that. I think uh, some of these are usually uh, years present now in the market. Okay, uh, this uh, drug classes up more specifically on the site if the problem uh, associ are associated with asthma. So uh, again, uh, I think you are familiar with this, especially the second one, Monte Lucast. Okay, so these are uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists. We have its therapeutic action, selective and com competitively block or antagonized receptors for the production of leukotrienes, components of SRSA, uh, blocks the signs and symptoms of asthma. Indications are prophylaxis, maintenance, and chronic treatment of bronchial asthma. This is not indicated for acute asthma attacks. Again, emphasizing it prophylaxis, maintenance, and chronic, okay, the word is chronic treatment of bronchial asthma. It's not indicated for acute asthmatic attacks, okay. Um, Leukotriene uh, receptor or the substance, it causes inflammatory changes in the lungs, okay. So, um, again, uh, Leukotriene receptor antagonist is used for prophylactic and maintenance drug therapy for uh, chronic asthma. Okay? It's not used for acute attacks. Okay, pharmacokinetics absorbed by the GIT, widely uh, distributed, metabolized by the liver, excreted through feces, but it can cause uh, placenta and uh, breast milk. So again, uh, caution with pregnancy and lactation, uh, patients with renal and hepatic dysfunctions. Adverse effects, we have headaches, dizziness, myalgia, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, uh, elevated liver enzymes, vomiting fever, myalgia. Okay, so um, it's better to uh, know these side effects know the interventions how to correct the side effects or to manage the side effects and to report them also okay so these are some of the drugs affecting respiratory system and i hope you have learned something or might add up in your knowledge and uh, or they called you to read more or to review more your concepts so this is your sir one uh, Sir Emil, your online nursing educator, and hope to see you in our next video lecture. God bless and uh, be the best uh, nursing student or nurses you can be. Okay. Thank you.